folks. We've got Simon Majumdar, you guys all know. He's a world-renowned broadcaster, food writer, speaker, author, cook. He's a uh, chief bottle washer and many other things. <laughs> but uh, and, and philanthropist and doing special events. So looking forward to hearing more about that. Uh, Brian Malarkey, you guys all remember him. We worked with him a few times. Um, and I just love what he's doing. I mean, his restaurant, uh, we had a great talk about the restaurant scene and how positive he is about this time and taking the, you know, the positive attitude instead of looking and saying, oh, my God, this is all wrong. It's like, OK, how can we make this right? How can we be better from it? So I'm really looking forward to that. You guys know he has many restaurants. Urban Wood is uh, one that we've been to before. And he's going to talk about anime uh, today as well. And then we've got Jack Lee, he's the CEO and Haiku Master from Data Central, and glad to have you back on our webinars. So uh, let's just get started, Simon, if you're ready. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. So, you know, when I chatted with Kevin and we talked about what I could come and kind of talk to you about, and I suggested a scotch tasting, it wasn't quite that altruistic because it's only one o'clock in the afternoon and it actually gives me an excuse to drink whiskey when I normally do without getting into trouble with my wife. So part of it, I have to say, is very selfish. Know that it is a liquor distilled from fermented wort, uh, and that's basically a beer. So a lot of actual distilleries may even work with a brewery to make this, and that comes from rye, corn, and primarily, particularly for single malts, has to come from barley mash. It was created to create perfumes, distillation, and medicines. And that's where the first whiskies, the water of life, were created. And they called it after their distillation method, which was burning underneath to burn off the liquids. And that in Islamic or in Arabic was al-kol. And that's where we get the word alcohol. Here we see a group of rather jolly monks. So the very first gins, or certainly proto-gins, were made in Italy. It moved from monasteries all across Europe. They first moved into Ireland and they started making them in all the monasteries there. And they would sometimes sail over to Scotland and serve them to the kings and the royalty in Scotland. So the first distilleries tended to be in the private home. Now, it grew in Scotland in these private houses, but whiskey was never the top drink until about the beginning of the 20th century. Most of Europe, Spain, Italy, France, it was almost completely wiped out. The grapes, therefore, for making brandy were wiped out. Now, Queen Victoria was obsessed with whiskey, and she had a gilly, a gamekeeper, called Jim Brown. And Jim Brown would follow her around, and every day would give her a large drop of whiskey that was made in the Balmoral Castle. He would also top off her tea with it, but one time when she couldn't get it, she went to another house that was making it. This was before it was even licensed properly and declared their whiskey so good that she gave it a royal license and they began to give them licenses. Quite frankly, it's a bit like marijuana here because they realized it was so popular they could make tax out of it. People talk about single malt. So single malt whiskey has to be made at one distillery and it has to be made out of blended malt barley. That's it. And this is actually my favorite style of whiskey. So this is blended malt, so single malts, but they don't have to be all from the same distillery. A classic version of this would be something like a Johnny Walker Blue. So that's made out of seven single malts from seven different distilleries. And these are the Scottish regions. So it's not Islay, and I've heard every pronunciation. Isla. Highlands. We're going to taste a Highland whiskey, a rather good one. Lowlands tend to be a little kind of earthier. We're not going to taste one of those, but go and try a Lowland. They're some of my favorites. Speyside tend to be the very fruity ones, really delicious. And Campbelltown, there's only two or three distilleries. You have to have three distilleries in a region for it to be, have its own region. So I know we've got Peat Monster up there. This is the bottle, Peat Monster. This is a blended malt. This is my favorite whiskey in the world. The youngest whiskey in this bottle is going to be 15 years old. The rest could be a lot more. This is the most expensive. The first whiskey, probably about $50. This one, probably about $120 a bottle. So this is a little more upscale. It's got that potpourri smell to it. That are single malts that are now being made around the world. Obviously Irish. My Yamazaki that I open for nobody that I bought for $40 at a Japanese airport and is now worth probably as much as my rent for a couple of months. And I wanted to bring in a whiskey that you'd never probably have heard before, but single malts now being made in India are really fantastic. You'll see what happens is when you add water into the whiskey, 
you're lowering the alcohol content, what happens is the flavonoids come out, so you can smell a lot more of the whiskey at the same time. Well, I think the lead-in by Simon talking about Scotch whiskeys is probably the best way to look at 2020 right now. All right, we're all gonna need to take a little edge off just to get through this little mess we've got ourselves into. I keep my drinking until a little later uh, in the evening, so I have a shorter runway <laughs> because I, I don't need much to take off. All right, you know, and once I take off, it's like Will Ferrell in uh, in the movie just tastes so good when it touches my lips. We do things wild, wild west out here. My restaurants seat about 300 people, 200 people. But I had this one, Herb and Wood, that had a cafe eatery in it that was a bake shop, did breakfast and lunch, and had these, you know, fresh pressed juices and big salads and grain bowls and all of this and retail and this. You know what we did? We gutted it. We gutted it right there. We gave away the refrigerators and I put tables, socially distanced for that whole thing because I wasn't selling liquor up there. My private event space, you know what I did? I socially distanced that. So on Saturday night, this last weekend, when we knew we might be going into the purple, we did 400 socially distance covered with zero people outside. Um, and people were ready to party and they were ready to have fun. And you didn't know it was a pandemic except for my staff wearing masks. Uh, you know, people are starting with a, a whiskey and finishing with a whiskey. You know, it's, a, it's, it's people are really out there. And like I said, somebody said this to me, and it was the best thing that keeps me going through this whole thing. A chef of my chef friend of mine in uh, Minneapolis, Stephen Brown. He said, Malarkey, he said, if we make it through this, we are going to reap the rewards. And I was like, what do you mean, chef? And he said, in 1918, the Spanish flu turned the world upside down. People were wearing masks. The hospitals were full. The government was imposing restrictions. They were doing this. And two years later, it was completely under control. And God forbid it takes two years to get this shit under control. But two years later, something magical happened. It was called the Roaring Twenties, all right? And we're right here, 100 years later, and people are about to start drinking, fucking dancing on the tabletop, having a good time. And if we can survive this, my friends, we are going to host the par biggest party the world has seen in 100 years. So there is a pot of gold, but this is certainly not a rainbow. Hey, why don't you talk, uh, Brian? That's awesome. That's awesome, awesome. And uh, you know what, we have, at every live event that we run, a chef has to drop an F-bomb, okay? So thank you for doing that, it makes me feel at home. Uh, <laughs> so, but why don't you walk us through, uh, I know you talked about the menu and cutting it back. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, you know what, what did you bring on, what did you get rid of, and, and how does the menu look so different today? Well, you know, it, we started, when we started back with just outdoor dining, we, we did, we took about half the menu, right? We needed half the staff, we needed half the front of the house, we needed half at the heart of the house, the back of the house. And so we really just gave a, a nice kind of, nice little spread, one pasta, two pastas, you got a protein, you got a fish, you got a chicken. People didn't care, they just wanted to go out. But we had worked ourselves back into indoor dining. And that menu was actually, and you know what? For three months, we didn't change the menu. Everybody, this is an interesting one here. I told somebody this the other day. So San Diego is a tourist um, establishment, right? We're based on tourism. People come here for convention, for tourism, and all that. My old way of building a restaurant, how I built Searsucker and Herringbone and Burlap and Gingham and all those other restaurants back in the day was, you build a great menu and you don't change it because by the time the, the information gets to, you know, Iowa, Minnesota, you know, Kentucky, and people are coming from those conventions, they want to have the Branzino. They want to have the eggs and the bacon. They need to have the Iberical Hamon dish they've heard so much about, right? So the dishes become legend. And a little bit over time, the locals go, where's the new restaurant? Where's the new restaurant? So they're not coming to me, they're going to the newer restaurants and checking things out. Or if they are the, the special occasion restaurants, they're going out once or twice a year and they're coming to have the Branzino, you know? And so as the pandemic hit, for the first three months we had outdoor dining, we didn't change anything because we wanted people to come back and have those dishes they'd had before, right? And then all of a sudden I realized, well, I don't have any tours. I don't have any conventions. 
I've lost the locals. I need the locals to get fired up. So I actually started gassing the menu, having more fun. I'm, I'm so excited to be at work. I was doing tableside Dover Soul like it was like the early 2000s. I mean, I was having, I'm having fun. I'm shaving truffles. Now I've found that people are so excited. I made a rabbit and carrot pizza. Now I'm just putting shit out there that's just like, whoa, what's he doing? Oysters Rockefeller with bone marrow. You know, like, oh, stuff that they, they write about on the stuff they post on Instagram, stuff they're posting and talking about, you know, are they going to eat it? No, but wow, Malarkey's really put a lot of new stuff on the menu. I got to go check it out. And on 400 people the other night, I mean, 40% of them were birthdays because I am the local restaurant, local restaurant, and there's just so few options right now. So it really made us get back on our toes and get very creative, and it's been fun. So the menu's actually gassed out right now, but now I'm shifting back down and going, oh. So if these are the restaurant foods that people are most excited for, what's the stuff that, what are the things that people least want to get from a restaurant? Peanut butter and jelly sandwich, oatmeal, baked beans, casserole, (laughs) Basically all the stuff that, you know, you've been having at home. So we need to get back to the exciting things. And one way to think about this is look at the foods that people say, if I'm going to have it, I feel like I got to get it from a restaurant. So these are the ones that dominate the top of that list. What do you notice among these foods? Right. This is among thousands of different things you could eat. These are the ones that people most say, if I'm going to have it, I got to get it from a restaurant. Okay. Wonton, sushi, uh, Jamaican food, uh, cannolis, Middle Eastern food, with the exception of, I think, like donut, maybe, it's all stuff from around the world, right? That's it. That's where restaurant stuff wins out, is all the things we could bring from other cultures and the dishes that people are just, frankly, not ready to make at home or they just don't know how to. Put it another way, we can look at this at the cuisine level, right? What are the foods that people, you know, cuisines that people feel like they want to have at home versus away from home? Away from home wins in almost every case, except for American food at the bottom Mm. and and arguably Italian and Mexican food, which you could almost argue are sort of like American food in some way or so entrenched in just like what we consider to be American food. I hope that as people go out, they'll try more scotch. I know bourbon. We had a fantastic session on bourbon last time I was able to join in and it was wonderful. I want people to go back and discover scotch in all of its varieties now. Go and see it and don't just get stuck on single malt. Go and try bl- uh, blended malt and if you want to, I am not paid, but go and buy a bottle of Peat Monster. Cool. Jack, your final thoughts? Uh, I think this session was amazing. I-, I actually want to compliment everyone on this panel and also you, Kevin, for this thing you put together. It was extraordinarily well done. Uh, I feel like I should have just been a spectator today, but it was awesome. Good job. Thank you. We always appreciate you being with us too. And the final say will be, will be Brian. You, Hi. you are awesome. Yeah. Thanks for your energy Hi. and your positive attitude. Thank you, Jack. No, I was screenshotting the, the, their information, so it, it, it's so oh, good. I texting someone, I'm like that asshole. He's like not paying oh, no, attention. No, but <laughs> there was some great intel out there. I didn't know Jamaican was number four. It was pretty exciting. Um, but the idea is, you know, down here, kind of in the in the in the forest, you don't see the trees sometimes, and you really had a big perspective up there. I was just telling you what I see in the trenches on a day to day basis here. Um, you know, and I think we'll all be drinking a lot more when we get through this thing. But there is, like I said, some light at the end of the tunnel, my friends. And as difficult as it is right now, and I know a lot of people who are going to go food are killing it. There are people in this segment that are killing it. I'm on the higher end. We try to do to go food. It doesn't work. It doesn't offer the price value perception when I'm eating a steak or a a piece of fish out of this box I paid 50 bucks for or whatever. So that's not gonna be something I can grow into in the future. But I, like I said, the world is going to celebrate. And I, I think Jack is 100% right. People are gonna be bored of Zoom. They're gonna be bored of the old regular food they've been eating. And it's time for us, again, this is a new beginning. It feels like the world has torn us down. And it's time for us to come through the ashes and start kicking some ass and we have to get over the old comfortable and we have to start stepping it up and giving the world something new. There's a new audience out there, this whole new group of millennials with their money, these, all these people coming up and the way they eat, think and drink is all different. So dust, we have to dust ourselves off and come at this full force. So we are ready for the Roaring Twenties Part Two. 
Thank you all very, very much.